while we continue in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is a New Testament Gospel that just tells the story of Jesus Christ from the perspective of actually Peter. But Mark is the one writing down what Peter is preaching in Rome. The Gospel of Mark will be in chapter 9, beginning the first eight verses in chapter 9. The Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. This is the word of the living God. Verse 1, And he said to them, that is Christ, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Let's pray once again to bless, to ask the Lord to bless this time in his word. Lord, the power of your word lies not in the skill of a preacher. It lies not in the might of man. Lord, the power of your word lies in what is preached according to truth. The power of your word, Lord, is Christ preached rightly from the text. Lord, help us this morning to see Christ from the text. Help our hearts to be encouraged. Help our minds to be engaged. Confusing elements in the text. Text that has puzzled man smarter than I throughout church history, Lord. But we're about to embark on it. Help us to be faithful. But Lord, we need your spirit in order to do so. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You know, most of us don't really appreciate our children, sorry, our parents as children. Most of us don't really appreciate those around us as children, our uncles, our grandparents, our, the friends of our family members, our pastors, when we're children. Mostly because you fail to see these people for who they are, right? I remember my whole life, in a sense, never really taking in who my parents were and what they were doing for me. And then you reach an age you know, usually around adulthood where you begin to see all that my parents did for me and your love for them increases. Why? Because now you're beginning to see them for what they did and who they really were. And this morning, that, that's all I'm hoping is that we begin to see Christ for who he really is, for his true intrinsic glory that he has, the glory of the only son of God. But let's move in. We're recapping it. Luis preached last week, so I haven't preached for two weeks. But back two weeks ago, I was preaching on the call to die. Jesus said that he's going to be rejected to suffer and to die. Then he told his disciples, you too must carry your cross. You must suffer. You must be rejected. You must die. So what's on their hearts? What's on their mind? It's this element of going through the pilgrimage, going through life, suffering, having to be rejected, ultimately having to die. And this story is not an end of a conversation. Those story is that those scenes carrying out all the Gospels, all the synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Luke also record this for us. The same order of events. So the story is continuing. They're talking about things like the second coming. They're talking about things like re- the, the resurrection of the body. Or are they talking about what we see here? Because look at verse 1. He said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Well, 2,000 years have gone by. Many of these people have died and died and died. So what was Jesus saying here? Was Jesus 
wrong in his assessment? No, I think the transfiguration is what we're going to see is what we would call in theology an already and a not yet element. Okay? What does that mean? Right? Everyone who is a Christian this morning is already saved. Right? Presently, this morning is saved. But they're still awaiting to be fully redeemed from the body of corruption. So there's an already, I'm already saved, but there's a not yet, I will be further fully de- delivered from this body of flesh, right? Everyone this morning, Ephesians says, is already seated with Christ in the heavenly places, but I see you in front of me. So the not yet element of that verse is that there's coming a day where we will bodily be with Him in heaven, be with Him, seated with Him, ruling and reigning. reigning. So there's already a not yet. So what Christ is showing here is that the transfiguration was literally that. It was seeing the already elements of the kingdom of God, its power, its glory. The Mount of Transfiguration is a glimpse of what awaits us. But make no mistake, just because it's a glimpse, doesn't mean that Christ is not truly ruling and reigning this morning. Sometimes when I hear Christians, Christian churches preach, they preach as if Christ is not yet on a throne. They preach as if Christ is not yet Lord over all things. They preach as there's still a future kingdom waiting to be inaugurated. No. What did Christ say at his ascension? All authority has been given unto me. So here we're seeing that Christ this morning in our hearts and in the world, we can rightly and fully say Christ is king. Christ is king, dear Christians. Christ is king in North Korea. Christ is king in China. Christ is king in the States. Christ is king in Mexico. He's king all over the world. Though sinful man seeks to reject and and rebuke God in a sense. The creation doesn't have power over the creator. Christ is king and Lord all over the world. And all we see this morning in the Mount of Transfiguration is a glimpse of the glory of Christ. So that's what he meant in verse 1. That some are going to see the glimpse of the glory, the power of God in this mini Mount of transfiguration, this mini version of glory. And he goes on in verse 2, showing this to happen. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. A high mountain. High mountains in the scriptures are always used to give a reminder to the heart. Something important is about to happen. Something vital is about to happen. And even the little phrase there, six days, six days after. Well, Moses took Joshua six days after to go see the glory of the Lord, right? And they were on a high mountain themselves. And here Christ is, in a sense, taking his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And the other gospels tell us that they're going to go up to the mountain to pray, to plead before God, to be alone with him. Again, remember, Put yourself in these situations. If this morning, if this morning I told you in a year's time, all of you will die at the hands of persecution. I don't think you guys would leave this room with joy. I don't think you guys would leave this room excited for the death that is awaiting you in a year. So put your mind in the, put yourself in the mind of the disciples and of Christ. They have just got done talking about death and rejection and suffering. Where do they need to go? but up the mountain to pray and be alone with God to get strength again. Such a small little sentence there at the end of verse 2, and he was transfigured before them. Transfigured. The Greek word is actually something more akin to metamorphism. A, a, a metamorphism. Metamorphism. Which means it's the same person. He's not changing into something different. It's not a new Jesus. No, he's being transfigured. And what are they seeing? Again, if you could just picture this in your mind, the other Gospels show us that, in a sense, the disciples were beginning to grow tired and weary in prayer. And then they see the glory of the Lord. And they wake up. They're now fully engaged. They're seeing Christ, who he was before he came to this earth. They're seeing the glory that he possessed in himself. They're seeing all that would have been concealed by human flesh is now being revealed before these disciples. 
John 17, when Christ is praying, he says, God, restore unto me the glory that I once had with you. We're getting a peek into that. Christians, do you understand what you're reading? You're reading the veil being removed for a second for you. You're seeing the exact imprint, the exact radiance. There's the sun, and here are the sunbeams. You're seeing that exact same thing with Christ, the sun, the glory of God. He's not receiving glory, right? Remember when Moses went up the mountain. If you guys know your Old Testament, maybe you're going through it in your yearly Bible plan right now. Moses goes up the mountain and he comes down with his face shining that he has to wear a veil. He's receiving glory. He is a recipient of glory. No, that's not Christ. Christ himself is the glory. He is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness. So what we're seeing here is not Christ receiving anything. No, he's revealing who he was. So much glory that even in verse 3, his, his clothes are radiant. Like no one could ever bleach on this earth. Right? His clothes are shining, bright shining like the sun. What would this have been like, church? If you could for a second take your mind, the, your mind's eye and meditate the glorious, pure, white, shining Savior will one day be bloody. One day that face that is shining like the sun will have drops of blood falling down from his face. One day those perfectly white robes that he's wearing here will be stripped from him and we'll be seeing him hanging there dying and naked for us. One day, this one who's receiving the Father's glory will be forsaken by his Father on the cross. You see what's going on here? You need to see who it was that died. It was the Son of God, the glorious Son of God. It wasn't just another man. He is the glory. And then randomly, two men show up, verse 4, and there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Elijah with Moses. It doesn't say that there had to be discussion when Elijah and Moses came down. Hey, by the way, I'm Elijah. I'm Moses. Good to meet you guys. No, they just recognized them. Right? They saw them come and appear, and they knew who they were. A little theology on heaven. In heaven, we're going to be able to recognize each other. In heaven, we're going to be able to see each other and not have to introduce one another. We'll be given knowledge about who each other were. Right? We won't have the same relationships that we had on earth. Right? For instance, I will not be married to Isa in heaven. But I'll see Isa in heaven and think, man, so much of who she was on earth prepared me for this. So much of our relationship prepared me for heaven. So here we see Moses and Elijah show up and they're recognizable. But why Moses and Elijah? Why not Abraham? Why not David? Why not Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or someone else? Why is it these two men? And as succinct as I can say, it's because they represent all of the Old Testament. Okay? Moses, Elijah. When Jesus refers to the Old Testament, what does he say? The law and the prophets. And that covers everyone in the Old Testament. The law and the prophets. The law, Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He is the law. Right? Elijah doesn't have a book named after him but arguably the best prophet. No one did wonders like Elijah. No one was able to do the signs that Elijah did. And Elijah was taken away in a fire, in a chariot of fire. Why? Because Malachi, the last verse of the Old Testament says, when Elijah returns, he will restore unto Israel the kingdom of God before the great day of judgment. Well, that's why we see Moses and Elijah there. We don't know what they were talking about. We don't know why Elijah and Moses and Jesus were having a meeting at the top of the mountain. But Luke tells us. If you turn to Luke, you'll see this story developed a little bit further. And they, Luke there tells us that they're talking about the deliverance that was to happen in Jerusalem. The deliverance. You know what the Greek Septuagint word uses for deliverance? It's called the exodus. In Jerusalem, there will be another exodus, another delivering from the bondage of sin. And that's what they're talking about. This monumental event. Why? Because Elijah and Moses know they need that event to happen. They, they already are in glory, in a sense, getting the retroactive payment of Christ. But they're there. 
Could we say encouraging Christ? I'd be comfortable with saying that. Can you say that they're there in a sense to show Christ what awaits him when he returns to glory? I'd feel comfortable with saying that. Elijah and Moses, what we're seeing here is essentially these two men coming, knowing that they're nothing before Christ, and in effect they're saying Christ is supreme over all things. Christ is supreme over the law and the prophets. Christ is more glorious than an old mediator Moses. Christ is better as a better prophet than Elijah. He is the fulfillment, the culmination, the central figure of all redemptive history is here. The glorious Christ. All that Israel has been waiting for. And this morning, Christian, all that you should be waiting for, he's before your eyes now. The glorious Christ, transfigured, glowing with glory. And my man, Peter, oh, good Peter, (laughs) good intentions, but such a funny guy. Look at verse five. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. You could say by the understatement of the century. It's good that we're here, Lord. You're seeing the glory of God and it's just good that we're here, Lord. And then he goes on to have such terrible theology. Look at what he says. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Peter was, again, heartfelt, a good guy, wanting to express his gratitude. But then here we see he wants to make three tents, three tents of meeting, three tabernacles. The tents of meeting and the tabernacles were always used to commemorate what God had done for them, right? They were delivered. They made these tabernacles to remember that they were delivered. And Peter's saying, let's just do this now. Let's set up three tents for you. Let's make you guys stay and be worshipped now. Again, Peter is saying, before my eyes, Moses and Elijah and Jesus are all equal. That's what, in effect, Peter is saying. That there's nothing different between Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And we're seeing his terrible theology get the best of him. Why, though? Because of verse 6. Verse 6 shows us, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. He's just scared. Probably feeling awkward that he's seeing so much glory, he just speaks up out of turn. So that's what we see. Peter wants to set up tabernacles and tents for him. And then on the heels of that, Luke says, while Peter was still speaking. Okay, so picture it. Peter's saying silly things. He's scared. He doesn't know what to say. In the middle of a sentence, verse 7 comes to life. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. God, the Father, arrives at the scene. Yahweh is here. And if you remember, why a cloud? This is why it's so important to know your Bibles, Christian, because the cloud is so important in the Old Testament. You see the cloud over Mount Sinai. You see the cloud over the tent of meeting. You see the cloud hovering over the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory of God. You know, there's a scene where Moses cannot enter the tabernacle because the glory is too powerful for him to go in. So God here, in a sense, could be using Peter's silly words to build up this tabernacle idea for three different people. No, God kind of comes down on a cloud, in a cloud. But where's the tabernacle? Christ, dear church. Christ is that tabernacle. John is clear. He dwelt among us. The eternal word. The word who was with the Father, the word who who was God and is God. What does John say? That word came down and came down and dwelt among us. The Greek word there for dwelt is what? It's a tabernacle. He tabernacled amongst us. So we see here, Christ is that perfect tabernacle. Not a mountain, not a tent. It's Christ. It's Christ. And God speaks, this is my son, my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Messianic titles, we know this for sure. And then the scene ends there in verse 8. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Such an interesting scene, right? If you could put yourself in these shoes, you would have beheld this for maybe 10 minutes, 50 minutes, and then it's over. So what does this mean for us? Right? What application, what, what does this bear on the life of the Christian in 2020? I just have two simple points. Number one, God the Father, but I will say God as a Father. 
Okay, God as a father. Before I begin, there's some silly people who think that Jesus needed to remember that he was God here. It's called a kenosis theology, that when, God came, when Christ came to the earth, he emptied himself of deity, and now in his life he's remembering, oh yeah, I'm, I'm deity. No, that, that's silly. That is not what's going on here. But I do want to add that Christ was fully human. He was fully and truly man. Again, remember, Christ as a man is not looking forward to dying. He's not looking forward to suffering. Christ in his emotions is not somehow morbid in his affections. He's still having to wrestle with these thoughts that one day is coming where he will be rejected by his father and all those whom he loves and the disciples as well. So what we see here, when Christ speaks, when God, sorry, speaks out of the cloud, he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. What we're seeing is a gracious display of God the Father's fatherly care for his son. His fatherly care for his son. You know, we always say, you know, praise God the Father has that little ending, the Father, become just a title for us this morning? Have we just been so accustomed to seeing God as the Father, God the Father, as nothing more than just the first person of the Trinity? No, He takes on the title of Father specifically, church, to show you you have a, famili a famili familial relationship with Him. He is our Father. He affirms His Son. He knows that his son and his humanity is not looking forward to the death that awaits him, the suffering that awaits him, the rejection that awaits him. So what does he do? Like a gracious father, he looks at his son and he says, I'm pleased with you, son. I'm overjoyed with you, son. All that I sent you to the earth to do, you're completing it for me. There's something called the covenant of redemption, dear church, where before there was humanity, before there was creation, the Son, the Father, and the Spirit entered into a covenant to redeem a sinful people. And when Christ comes to the earth, He's here on a mission. What did He say? I didn't come to do my own will, but the, the will of the Father who sent me. So here we see at the baptism, Christ begins His ministry. And what does the Father say? My Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now here, a year out from death, what does God reiterate to His Son? My Son, and you I am well pleased. There is such fatherly care from God the Father here. He even gives them a glimpse of glory. Right? When we're trying to attain something, when we're trying to lose weight, save money, do any type of goal, what is the most effective thing for us? To see our goal. Right? Put it up on your refrigerator so every morning when you want to get something to eat, you, uh, that's my goal. I can't do that. Right? Every morning when you want to spend money, you see, there's my goal. I'm not going to spend money because they see the, the goal before them. What's God doing here? He's putting before his own son what it lies ahead after the suffering, what comes after the rejection, what comes after the forsaking of his own son. It's glory, my son. It's glory. Christians, especially those of you who are parents this morning, take a little, a little tool from God the Father's toolbox here. Look at your children every once in a while. When your children perform as you've required of them, when you tell your children what is the answer to this catechism question and they get it right, don't boast up their ego, but tell them, I'm, I'm pleased with you. You are doing what I've required you to do. Right? I'm not into the whole self-esteem game, lying to your children so that they could feel good about themselves. No, that's not what I'm saying. But when they are doing things according to what you have designed for them, don't neglect looking them in the eye and telling them, as, as your father, I'm proud of you, my son. As your father, I'm proud of you, my daughter. And what happens there, a relationship is created between you and your child that as they develop and as they get older, there begins to be a warmth between your relationship where you have won over their conscience, where you have won over their hearts, and they'll trust you, and now they'll come to you and now they'll even ask you life advice. Why? Because your whole life, you've not just been a cruel schoolmaster, you know, spanking them whenever they're wrong. But you've been this father, this mother, who's been invested in their little hearts, looking at them and saying, my son, I'm your father, and I'm proud of you. My daughter, I'm your father, and you bring me so much joy. 
If God the Father does that for God the Son, Jesus Christ, parents, we would do well to emulate this. So God, as His Father, He's looking at His Son, seeking to encourage His Son. Isaiah, speaking of the Messiah, says that Yahweh will uphold His servant. Yahweh will truly be sustaining His servant, the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant. And that's what we see here. God, the voice of God, saying, this is my son, and essentially pro providing for Christ strength, providing for Christ a will to press on, providing for Christ a hope of the glory that waits ahead, showing him your suffering will lead to glory, my son. Your suffering will lead to glory. That's the first point. God's fatherly care for his son and the beauty of it. And number two, the glory is Christ should honestly be the only motivation that we need, dear church. If we're seeking motivation to live the Christian life and any other thing, we can honestly say those things are our glory. That is what we truly aspire to, right? No, but Christ in His beauty, the veil being pulled back for us. Listen, I get this question probably more, more, more than any other question as a pastor, how do I live the Christian life? How do I make sure that I have strength to live the Christian life? How do I make sure that I have endurance to run the race from now until I die? How do I keep a passion and a zeal? It's this, dear church. It's seeing the glory of Christ. Seeing the glory of His person. Seeing the glory of who He is. If every Sunday, honestly, the best thing that I could do for us is seek to give us a mini transfiguration in our hearts every single Sunday. We get the story laid out for us. Christ in His glorious, radiant self there, beaming with the sun, with the glory of the sun. We get this easily this morning. But we should have this every Sunday. The glorious Christ, the glorious Christ, the glorious Christ. If I could somehow, honestly, if I could somehow take Christ and put it in each and every one of your hearts, I would. If I had the chance to put deep, deep theological things, I would do that too. But first, I would put Christ there, because Christ is the lens by which we see all other things. If I could somehow show you in His Word, if I could somehow show you by my preaching His glory and His power, I would do that. But see, I, I, I can't do that for us. Only the Spirit could truly do that for us. Only our pleading before the Spirit to reveal Christ to us. Sometimes I get so upset in Reformed churches because the Sunday service sounds like a Sunday school adult service. The Sunday school, you know, for adults is meant to be slightly more educational, slightly more classroom setting, more of a presentation than anything else. And then I go to some Reformed churches or I see them online and I think, your Sunday service is the exact same thing. Your morning worship is the exact same thing. But the worship service is not Sunday school church. It's where we seek to see Christ in His glory. And Lord willing, Lord willing, we this morning are truly seeing Christ. Right? What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the greatness, the beauty, the perfection of all that He is. Meaning, when we come here, in our hearts to the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John. When we come here and we see Him, all that He is, who He was before He came to the earth, the secret and the joy to contentment is here, church, when you see Christ, the Son of God, for who He truly is. I, I used to always wonder, you know, there's men like Paul Washer, who every sermon that he got a chance to preach outside of his local church would preach the exact same sermon, the glory of Christ, the glory of Christ, the glory of Christ. And I used to think, Paul Washer preached something else. But no, Paul Washer would go to these other churches and preach the glory of Christ. Why? Because he knew that wherever he went, he knew that the people needed to behold the glory of Christ. Now, I don't have the luxury of preaching the same sermon to you every Sunday. But thanks be to God that this morning we have the transfiguration story before us. Seeing the pre-incarnate Christ and all that he is and all of his person. Now, for us. Now, we see what happens after this. We know what comes after this. This glorious, perfect Son. Listen, dear church. The second person of the Trinity 
the incarnate word, the lamb who will receive crowns upon crowns will be slain for us in maybe a year's time when we finally get there in the book of Mark. But would you be able to see that? Who it was that died for you? Who it was that gave up his life for you? Who it was that was forsaken on the cross for you? It was this glorious Christ. The one who had all the glory in him, had all the joy of the Father, was in the bosom of the Father before he came to earth. And we're seeing him here glorious and radiant. And so, he says, listen to him. Do you see what God said there? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. You see his glory. You see his Shekinah glory. You see who he is. Now listen to him. It isn't enough just to see him. You have to see him and then listen to him. You know, Christ has some funny standards for friends, right? He says, you know, you're my friends. If you love me, you'll do what I say. Imagine any of us treat each other like that. Hey, if you love me, you'll do what I say. If you love me, you'll do what I say. No, we don't have the glory to say that. Christ does. So if you love Christ, you will listen to what he says. When you, if you love Christ, you'll keep his commandments. If you love Christ, you'll listen to him as you're suffering with him. You'll listen to him in the hope that awaits you. You'll listen to him in all of your needs and all of your wants. You'll listen to him in your marriages and what you're called to do in your marriages. You'll listen to him when he truly tells you that he will not lose you nor forsake you so you have peace with him. You'll listen to him if you truly see his glory. You see that there. You see the glory. This is the glory of Christ. Now listen to him. The more that we behold the glory of Christ, the more that we see who he is in his person, the easier it'll be to listen to him, dear church the easier it will be to actually follow the commandments of our living God. So why listen to him? Because he's the glorious son of God who died for us, church. He's the glorious son of God who paid the final payment on the cross for us. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a man. He's not just a kind guy who came and did good things and good signs amongst people. No, the second person of the Trinity came to die for you and die for me. And so we must listen to him, dear church. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the glimpse of glory that you have given us this morning. The Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah appear there, even showing us that Christ is the supreme prophet. Christ is the supreme mediator. Christ is the final sacrifice. Christ is the ultimate offering before you. And now Christ is seated in heaven and in glory this morning, ruling and reigning in our hearts and in the world, Lord. We cannot fathom or comprehend who Christ truly is. But Lord, would you help us to just grab a hold of something that we would endure the week and have strength for the fight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.